Thanks for having me. My name is Cole Stryker. I'm an author based in New York. And I've spent the last couple years of my life studying anonymity, first through uh, the similar stuff that Parmi has been working on, studying Anonymous and 4chan and these uh, communities that have chosen to um, operate under the veil of anonymity for various reasons, for good and bad. Um, yes, so uh, I basically decided to talk about a history of anonymity. And there's a couple reasons. One is because I think that there are probably a lot of people in this audience who are of the opinion that if I've done nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. This is actually a widespread opinion in American society, um, shared by a lot of my close friends and family before my book came out. So this, that book was kind of dedicated to them. And then the other reason is I have a personal rule uh, not to talk too much about technology when there's a guy with a ponytail talking after me. Uh, so I won't be talking. I don't want to look too, too foolish. So I'll, I'll focus on the history. Um, so yes, uh, Anonymous uh, was this group of trolls and, and pranksters that um, basically were lighting up the internet um, right before I got my book deal. And around that time, they started to take this kind of pseudo-political bent where they were going after people that they thought were censoring the web, uh, promoting surveillance. And this picture is just an example of, of what Anonymous was doing around the time Mountain Dew did a contest where they invited the internet to name their new flavor of Mountain Dew. And the winner was Hitler did nothing wrong, which is basically just this way of saying, uh, if you come onto our internet and, and try to capitalize uh, from our creativity, this is what you're going to get in return. Um, they weren't particularly big fans of my book. Uh, th these quotes are from reviews on Amazon. Um, they basically don't like it when people write about them, or at least at the time before they became a huge media sensation. This was basically the reaction that you would get um, if you uh, wrote about Anonymous. Um, and uh, they, they gave me the same kind of treatment that Parmi got, where they tried to find out where I lived. They harassed my family. They sent unsolicited pizza deliveries. They uh, sent me all kinds of junk mail. They sent my aunt a letter under my name that was basically like a, a deep confession of my sexual urges toward her and that we had to meet <laughs> at some point. And this woman's in her 60s, so uh, basically my family and friends w couldn't understand. They, they were like, there ought to be a law that pe people shouldn't be allowed to say these kinds of nasty things about you online. Um, you know, and just hide behind anonymity. It doesn't seem fair. And I, I just found that to be such a widespread view that that became the subject of my next book. And even very powerful people, I, I kind of dedicated the book to Randy Zuckerberg, who's the sister of Mark, who founded Facebook. Um, she said, I think anonymity on the internet has to go away. So obviously a person in a pretty powerful position who holds this belief. Here's a couple other examples, Eric Schmidt of Google and Randy's sister, Mark, who are basically saying the same things along the lines of, if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide. So uh, without further ado, I would like to get into a history of Anonymous. I'm opening up with my favorite quote from Emily Dickinson, which was a, a widespread opinion shared by women of her day. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So there are a couple of reasons why someone might have wanted to be anonymous. Um, and one might be to uphold modesty. So uh, an example I like is the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. He was someone who didn't want to associate his work with himself because he didn't want to take attention away from his creator who he was trying to um, you know, basically praise through this work. Another example, here we have uh, Alice in Wonderland. The author, Lewis Carroll, that wasn't his real name. Uh, Charles Lutwidge Dodgson is his real name. Um, basically didn't want to associate his childish stories with his serious academic work and was a painfully shy mathematician, didn't want those two worlds colliding. So he had a kind of a prismatic viewpoint of his own identity, where in this place I'm this person, and in this place I'm this person. Another reason to be anonymous might be to stymie sexists. Um, there are countless examples of this throughout history. Um, two of my favorites are uh, Charlotte Bronte, um, who has a great quote here, basically saying, I want to be judged, judged as an author, not as a man or a woman. And in those days, being a woman author invited uh, an unimaginable amounts of, of prejudice against one's works. Uh, another great example is Marianne Evans, who you all know as George Eliot. Uh, very similarly, she used her second identity as a tool that could be dropped at any moment were it to cease to be useful for her. Um, I have a friend who wrote for the political blog Wonket for some time under the pseudonym Ask a Lobbyist and basically spent uh, over a year talking about the seedy underbelly of the lobbying industry in Washington, D.C., cultivated a rabid following, 
and basically, as soon as they found out she was a woman, immediately turned on her. Her comment section became a landfill of people calling her fat and ugly and a pig, and basically something that would never happen to a man because men are in our society are, are valued more on their ideas that they bring to the table, and women are, are valued based on their uh, looks. So uh, I think that this, to say that this is something that we no longer have to deal with is a, a, a position that can only be driven by privilege and ignorance. Uh, to make mischief is another example. The, the, the examples here are kind of like the, the godfathers of the anonymous group. Um, here we have Gulliver's Travels, uh, written by Jonathan Swift, who is throwing basically like intellectual Molotov cocktails at the establishment, whether it was the crown or the church. Um, he also wrote a book about how, uh, or an essay about how the starving Irish should eat their children as a way of um, using satire to attack uh, the governing ways of the uh, English people um, that obviously would have gotten him killed or uh, put in jail for life had those sentiments been associated with his real name. Um, and then most importantly, in my opinion, uh, one might want to be anonymous to elude the noose. This here is Thomas Paine. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. But I just, I, I don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to buzz through these bullet points. 1538, first licensing law in place. So everything that's printed has to be run by a, a royal um, analyst, I guess you would say, to make sure that it doesn't say anything nasty about the crown or the church. Um, sometime later, printers also included. It wasn't good enough just to go after the author. If you were caught printing something that was written by uh, someone who had something nasty to say, you were also, um, your neck was on the line. Uh, 1579, this is one of my favorite stories, John Stubbs wrote, the discovery of a gaping gulf wherein England is like to be thrown by another French marriage, which was a, a work of political satire. And uh, I think he's particularly interesting because they cut off his hand and his name was Stubbs, so it almost is a perfect outcome for him. Um, in 1589, Martin Marprelate was published, and it was one of the first works to use anonymity, not as just a defense, but an offense. So this guy's naming names of real people in power you know, basically uh, criticizing them publicly in a way that they couldn't fight back because he was anonymous. In 1643, uh, another printing regulation where instead of the crown, it becomes the state, it becomes the primary body for deciding what stuff can be published and what stuff gets someone killed or thrown in jail. Um, Trees and Act Printing Act, more of the same. Um, John Twin was a printer who, uh, printed something by an anonymous author and had his head put on a spike and his body quartered and each of his body parts were put on the gates of London just as a sign to anyone who might try to pull something like that. Um, and then things start to get better. You've got John Locke uh, publishing two treatises, Cato's Letters, two works that are very uh, influential on America's founding fathers. Uh, in 34, John Peter Zinger is acquitted of um, basically criticizing a New York governor in a letter. Um, so that's like one of the first turning points where pe people in, in governance decide, well, we might, we might want to cool it a little bit with putting all these people in jail. Um, and then, of course, 1776, monumental year, Thomas Paine writes Common Sense under a pseudonym called An Englishman, not Thomas Paine. And then over the course of the next century, you've got abolitionists, pacifists, anti-monopolists, also using an anonymity or pseudonymity in, in order to speak out against the powers that be. Um, and then fast forwarding all the way up to the 1958, uh, we've got a couple of court cases that were important, NAACP versus Alabama. Um, Alabama decides that it wants the membership list of the NAACP. The NAACP says, hell no, if you get this list, all of our members are going to have burning crosses on their lawns tomorrow morning. And um, the court favored uh, the NAACP. In 1960, Talley versus California. This was a, a anti-pamphleteering rule that basically said you can't distribute pamphlets unless there's a, a name on them, and that was overturned here. Um, and then skipping way ahead to 94, you start to see this in the digital realm. Um, Usenet group alt.religion.scientology was really the first fruits of the anti-scientology movement that we see um, really blown up with Anonymous 15 years later. Uh, and then anon.penet.fi, which is a Finnish um, anonymous remailer 
Uh, and you know, these were guys that had their doors kicked in by the FBI, hard drives seized, things like that, which really was kind of the, um, the trigger for the ha hackers being um, really hacktivists uh, was kind of born here, where they were fighting for freedom of, against censorship and for freedom of speech. And then in 97, <coughs> excuse me, uh, ACLU versus uh, Zell Miller, you've got the state of Georgia basically saying, nobody can use the internet under a pseudonym. And then thankfully the courts decided, Georgia, you don't own the internet, you don't run the show here, just chill out. Um, and then going alongside this history, we've got the history of cryptography, which I'm not really gonna get into because I've only got four minutes left. But it's, it's a fascinating history of how basically cryptographic technology uh, was liberated from the few organizations that had access to it, uh, mainly because it was used as a military tool. So you have the public now able to conceal their messages, digital messages, and mainly this happened because there was an economic reason. Banks needed to be able to secure financial data, and then over time it got to the point where the everyman, provided that he has the uh, tech savvy, can now use uh, this information, this technology to conceal their information. Um, so today, a lot of people in very powerful positions, like I said, are basically saying, why do we need privacy? And I think this is uh, really concerning. So here's a guy, this was a, one of, a very super prestigious journalist um, who basically says, if you're not a pedophile, you don't need privacy. Uh, he's never seen anyone using privacy for a good cause. And um, I would hope that if this journalist had at least just seen the last 10 minutes of my talk, would feel differently about it. Here's somebody else. This is a Microsoft researcher who basically wants driver's licenses for the internet. And any hacker will laugh at you if you tell them that this is a possibility. But uh, basically this would be, be an authentication wall that would work, in, work like a login to Facebook where you would log in to the entire internet instead of just individual websites and everything you say and do online can be traced to you. Very unlikely that that would ever happen, but there are people who would like to see it happen. So again, we come back to these questions. If I've done no nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. Um, another one that I think is privilege related. Isn't this just a fake problem that doesn't matter to people who have never have had to worry about putting food on the table? And my argument is that anonymity and, and uh, privacy issues are of most concern to people that are on the fringes, the most marginalized, least privileged people. For instance, if you're a homosexual teenager living in Iran, um, you could very likely be rounded up and shot. That happened. Um, so that, I mean, I wouldn't call that person someone who's in a privileged position. Uh, and then there's the, the quote unquote four horsemen of the infocalypse, these you know, pedophiles, uh, cyber thieves, cyber terrorists, things like that. What, what's gonna happen if we allow for a world with anonymity? Won't these people just run rampant? Well, I've got news for you. We live in that world. And any kind of measures taken to uh, track people are easily circumvented by people who have enough technical know-how to get around them. So my opinion is that hackers are always gonna be one step ahead um, of the feds. And even though feds employ very smart hackers, uh, we should never underestimate the ability of people to break systems. And then finally, the but I live in America. We don't have censorship here. You're not gonna get your hand cut off if you speak out against Obama. Well, that might be true, but this presentation was written before those NSA leaks. And I think that that's kind of a case in point here, where we, we are far less secure than we thought our information was. And that the fact that the NSA has unfettered access into all these technological platforms that we're using on a daily basis should be cause for concern. And even if we don't, even if we trust Obama and even if we trust basically our benevolent overlords today, who's to say what the landscape's gonna look like 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line? The decisions that we make now are far reaching. So basically this is all setting up to what I was, what I like to call the identity wars, which was actually the original title of my last book, um, where you have a, a bunch of lightly or loosely related collectives like the Electronic F Frontier Foundation, WikiLeaks, and other activist groups. You've got Tor and Silent Circle, which are technological platforms that protect people's identities. And then you've got wildcards like Anonymous and the Bitcoin crowd that are trying to create ways where that people can perform commercial uh, transactions anonymously. And then on the other side, you've got Facebook, Google, 
the NSA, the FBI, governments like Chinese, and then uh, corporations like Chevron and AT&T. I threw Chevron on there because they're trying to uh, basically force corporations like Yahoo and Google to divulge nine years worth of email and web browsing history from some people that they're trying to fight in court. And um, so that's, you know, that, that kind of a threat could come from any powerful company. So I guess the, the whole thesis here is that the, the I've done nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide is a position that is informed by um, privilege. And that if you, if that's how you think, you're not thinking of the homosexual teenager who's living in Iran, or even the homosexual teenager who's living in Alabama and doesn't want his parents to find out. There are plenty of good reasons to want to have different kinds of identities that are contextual and look differently on different platforms. And um, I'll leave you with this story. I just read uh, a couple days ago that Mark Zuckerberg bought uh, the piece of property adjacent to his home because he wanted more privacy. I think that says it all. Thank you.